Good afternoon. My name is Rafael Espina. I'm the chair of the Committee on Consumer Affairs and Business Licensing. I'm joined today uh, by one of my colleagues, Karen Koswitz from Queens and also a huge fan of New York City's nightlife. Thanks for being here. Today the committee will be hearing testimony on four pieces of legislation. Intro Bill number 930, which is, co -sponsor which is sponsored by my colleague, Councilmember Brandon, would require event operators to stipulate the costs of additional service fees in their advertisements for, for events. Such disclosures could help to ensure that customers know ahead of time what the total cost of the ticket will be. The other three pieces of legislation are Intro Bill number 1185, which would require nightlife establishments to provide their staff bystander training on harassment between patrons and post signage in their venues that informs c customers about harassment. Intro bill number 1186, which will require the newly established Office of Nightlife to post anti-harassment information and online trainings on its website. And resolution number 580, which calls on New York State to update the mandatory security guard training curriculum to include sexual harassment prevention and bystander intervention training for all security guards who work in nightlife establishments. I'm the prime sponsor on all three of three pieces of legislation, and I'm eager to hear testimony on them today. The nightlife industry in New York City is a vital cultural and economic contributor to the fabric of the city, which is why this committee passed legislation to establish both the Office of Nightlife and the Nightlife Advisory Board. According to the Mayor's Office of Media and Entertainment, New York City's nightlife industry creates about $29 billion of economic activity, supporting 250,000 jobs and $11 billion in wages. However, too many nightlife patrons, particularly women, have come to expect that sexual harassment will be a part of their night out. I want to challenge this assumption. Through this legislation, I aim to tackle harassment in three ways. First, this will help raise awareness of patron-to-patron -patron harassment. Second, it will give tools to nightlife staff and venue owners on how to help prevent harassment and protect safe nightlife spaces. And third, it will provide information to patrons on what they can do if they have been the victim of harassment. According to the, to the country's leading sexual violence organization, RAIN, a person in the U.S. is sexually assaulted every 98 seconds. While this can happen in all types of spaces, violent men often use alcohol and nightlife as excuses for their harmful and dangerous behavior. This should stop today. Some bar, club, and event space owners in New York City are proactively working to reduce sexual harassment in their venues. House of Yes in Bushwick, for example, has a clear consent policy disclaimer included in all of its events details page. The policy states that the venue has a zero tolerance policy for harassment and encourages patrons who have been violated to report the incident to security or staff. Bystander intervention, where an individual witnessing harassment steps in to defuse the situation, is another common training model employed in schools, college campuses, and by the military to help prevent sexual assaults. Compared to other forms of sexual harassment training, Studies show that bystander intervention is an effective way to combat harassing behavior. It stops witnesses from feeling helpless and gives potential victims a trained resource. We look forward to hearing today from the administration, industry reps, advocates, and other stakeholders on what we can do to ensure that we both have a safe and vibrant nightlife culture in New York City. Before I call on the administration to testify, I want to also acknowledge we've been joined by Peter Koo from Queens, uh, and would like for the attorney to please administer the oath. Please raise your right hand. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee today and to respond honestly to council member questions? Yes. Do. Thank you. Please state your names for the record. Before you give your testimony, just state your name for the record. Then you give your testimony. Okay. And welcome to your first hearing. I Thank you so much. <laughs> Uh, my name is Ariel Pallets, uh, Senior Executive Director for the Office of Nightlife at the Mayor's Office of Media and Entertainment. <clears throat> Good afternoon, Chairman Espinal and members of the City Council Committee on Consumer Affairs and Business Licensing. My name is Ariel Pallets, Senior Executive Director of the Office of Nightlife at the Mayor's Office of Media and Entertainment. Thank you for the opportunity to testify before you today on the establishment of the Office of Nightlife and our progress thus far. Nightlife is vital to New York's economy as well as its identity. The industry supports nearly 300,000 jobs and generates $48 billion in economic activity. 
New York's nightlife has also been an important incubator of cultural movements and continues to provide spaces for creativity, social cohesion, and personal expression. The Office of Nightlife cements our city's position as a global leader in a growing movement of more than 40 major cities around the world and the United States, working to balance vibrancy and safety by proactively managing life at night. Similar efforts in cities such as Amsterdam, London, Berlin, San Francisco, Detroit, Pittsburgh, and Austin have yielded social benefits such as reductions in noise complaints and healthier, more productive nighttime economies. <coughs> Excuse me. I would like to recognize Chair Espinal and the Council for their leadership on the creation of the Office of Nightlife, as well as the repeal of the cabaret law that had required nightlife establishments to obtain a permit to allow patron dancing. These steps are a sign of a new approach that recognizes what nightlife contributes to New York while also addressing its challenges and impacts. As you know, the Office of Nightlife was established by Local Law 178 of 2017 to serve as a liaison to nightlife establishments in relation to city policies and procedures affecting the nightlife industry. To assist the mayor and the heads of city agencies that have duties relating to nightlife to serve as the intermediary between city agencies, residents, and the nightlife industry to pursue long-term solutions to issues related to nightlife, and to promote an economically and culturally vibrant nightlife industry while accounting for the best interests of the city, its residents, among other duties. That legislation also created the Nightlife Advisory Board, a 14-member independent body with five members appointed by the mayor and nine members appointed by city council to make its own recommendations to the mayor and city council. That board, was first, con that board first convened this August and its members, including business owners, community advocates, DJs, hospitality advocates, musicians, performers, and regulatory attorneys bringing a variety of perspectives and expertise. As a lifelong New Yorker and nightlife professional, I am excited to bring my industry and community building experience to my new role in public service. After working many facets of nightlife for well over 15 years, including as a promoter um, at nightlife music venues and an independent record label, as well as public relations, I opened and operated Sutra Lounge in the East Village, which I owned for 10 years. I also served on Manhattan's Community Board 3 and its Liquor Licensing Committee for six years and then ran a hospitality consulting company called Venue Advisors, providing integrated commercial real estate services for entrepreneurs seeking to open nightlife establishments. Housed at the Mayor's Office of Media and Entertainment under Commissioner Julie Menon, the focus of our team is addressing not only nightlife but life at night by proactively managing rather than restricting it. We are working to support businesses with resources and education to help them be successful in order to be better neighbors, to ensure safety and quality of life for everyone, and to enable creativity and culture to flourish. I am delighted to share some details about what we have been working on over the last few months. First, our five borough listening tour. As defined by Local Law 178, the Office of Nightlife is required to hold at least one public hearing in each borough at which public comments and testimony shall be received. These public hearings are designed to help inform our initiatives and po policy recommendations. To date, we have completed three out of five listening sessions. We will be in the Bronx this Thursday and we'll conclude our tour on November 28th in Manhattan. 
As a liaison between nightlife stakeholders and city and state government, we invited agencies with a role in managing nightlife to participate in the session so that they could listen and respond to issues and concerns from the public. We were pleased to have representatives from NYPD, FDNY, Department of Building, Small Business Services, Environmental, uh, environmental Protection, Health and Mental Hygiene, City Planning, Cultural Affairs, um, as well as the Office of Administrative Trials and Hearings, as well as the State Liquor Authority. To raise awareness about these meetings, we conducted extensive outreach to local elected officials and community boards, local business groups such as the Chamber of Commerce and Business Improvement Districts, nightlife organizations and advocates, local and citywide media outlets, as well as dozens of venues to reach patrons and staff. To date, over 400 people have participated in these listening sessions, and we have received more than 300 comments from a diverse range of stakeholders, including business owners and operators, advocates for grassroots cultural spaces, neighbors of nightlife establishments, musicians and performers, event promoters, and nightlife patrons. Among the issues raised are reports of adverse impacts of enforcement, operations from the multi-agency response to community hotspots known as March, noise issues and other quality of life concerns relating to nightlife activity, and as well as greater transparency in the review processes. Number two is the economic impact study of nightlife. Later this year, we will be releasing a study of the current economic impact of the nightlife industry which includes activities between 6 p.m. and 6 a.m. across all five boroughs. Preliminary findings show that, the, that New York City's 25,000 nightlife establishments account for an overall economic impact greater than $48 billion, including, three, including supporting 300,000 jobs, 13.1 billion in wages, 35.1 billion dollars in total economic output, output, and 698 million dollars in local tax revenues. To complement the economic impact analysis, more than 1,300 nightlife stakeholders participated in surveys or interviews about their experiences. These qualita this qualitative assessment surfaced challenges faced by the New Yorkers who rely on nightlife for their livelihoods, as well as those living in neighborhoods dense with nightlife establishments. Much of this feedback is consistent with the themes that are emerging in our listening tour. Together, these findings are informing the development of the Office of Nightlife's proposed programs and initiatives, including those that seek to improve the nightlife ecosystem by working to reduce red tape, address public safety and quality of life concerns, and promote economic development and cultural activity. Third is our in interagency working group. We have been look we have been looking while we have been looking to the listening tour, as well as other outlets to inform our proposed initiatives, many of which are in formation, we are already establishing a framework for how the Office of Nightlife engages with its city partners, as well as its public stakeholders. After the listening tour, we will be looking to convene an interagency working group to address po policy changes and coordinate existing initiatives that currently impact nightlife. This working group can evaluate potential administrative and regulatory reforms for how the city can support safe and vibrant nightlife activity and mitigate adverse impacts where applicable. This may include a review of regulatory policy to focus on education, prevention, and correction of common issues and improve predictability in inspection processes, policies that reduce related noise-related disputes between nightlife establishments and their neighbors through both physical measures as well as sound insulation and human services such as mediation 
and capacity building and compliance assistance for small cultural nightlife spaces that foster creativity, performance, and art production. Number four is our one-stop nightlife web portal. Many stakeholders have called for the Office of Nightlife to post resources online that support business operations and employee and patron safety. We are also looking into the development of an online portal at nyc.gov nightlife to assist various stakeholders. One aspect will be a tool for new and prospective nightlife establishments, directing them to information and providing user-friendly graphical resources that integrate or leverage other agency guidelines, forms, permits, and regulations. It will also include best practices for patron safety and workplace safety as well, working with outside advocates and experts as well as our city partners. We also look forward to developing informational resources that address common issues related to patron safety and workplace safety. Issue areas currently under consideration include reducing impaired driving, drug and alcohol awareness, fire safety measures, training protocols for staff for prevention of theft, violence, sexual assault, or overconsumption, codes of conduct and consent education for patrons, LGBTQ safety, and other preventable hazards. I am encouraged by the partnerships we have been able to build thus far including advocates, elected officials, industry and community representatives, and among our sister agencies. I thank you once again for the opportunity to speak with you today and want to recognize once again the chair's leadership and passion to bring these issues to the forefront. As you can see, the Office of Nightlife is working very hard to ensure that the nightlife industry can continue to contribute to the cultural, social, and economic well-being of New Yorkers. I look forward to the exciting work ahead and to answering any questions you may have. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chair Espinal, Councilmember Kozlowitz. My name is Casey Adams, and I am the Director of City Legislative Affairs for the New York City Department of Consumer Affairs. I would like to thank the committee for the opportunity to testify today on behalf of our commissioner, Laura Lay Salas, about introduction 930-2018, a bill that would require the operator of a place of entertainment or its agent to disclose service fees along with the price of a ticket on advertising and promotional materials. DCA's mission is to protect and enhance the daily economic lives of New Yorkers to create thriving communities. In general, DCA believes that greater price transparency and information benefit consumers by helping them make informed choices about products and services. We understand and share the Council's concern about services that don't clearly disclose fees associated with ticket purchases until consumers are several steps into a transaction. Requiring earlier disclosure of fees in advertising and promotional materials could help consumers understand the full cost of a purchase up front rather than being surprised later. We look forward to working with the Council to ensure that the bill is crafted in a manner that captures the services intended, protects consumers, and minimizes compliance costs for businesses. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chair Espinal and members of the Committee on Consumer Affairs and Business Licensing. I'm Dana Sussman, Deputy Commissioner for Policy and Intergovernmental Affairs at the New York City Commission on Human Rights. And I'm pleased to be here today with my colleagues from the Office of Nightlife and Department of Consumer Affairs to discuss the work of the Commission and the administration in combating sexual harassment. Because the Commission had not, has not previously had the opportunity to appear before the committee, um, I'll briefly describe the work of the agency. By statute, the Commission has two main functions. The first is as a civil law enforcement agency enforcing the city's anti-discrimination law called the City Human Rights Law, one of the most comprehensive anti-discrimination and anti-harassment laws in the country. The Commission's Law Enforcement Bureau investigates complaints of discrimination from the public, initiates its own investigations on behalf of the city, and utilizes its in-house testing program to help identify entities breaking the law. 
The law includes 24 categories of protection, most of which protect against discrimination and harassment in practically all areas of city living, employment, housing, public accommodations, on the street, in transit, and in other spaces. The second main function of the commission is to perform community outreach and provide education on the city human rights law and human rights related issues, which is why the commission also has a community relations bureau which has offices in all five boroughs. The Community Relations Bureau provides free workshops on individuals' rights um, and businesses, employers, and housing providers' obligations under the city human rights law and creates programming on human rights and civil rights related issues. Combating sexual harassment, particularly in the workplace, but across all areas of jurisdiction, has been a core focus of the Commission's work since Commissioner Carmelin P. Malalas took helm of the agency almost four years ago. For example, in 2015, the Commission issued its highest civil penalty in the history of the Commission in a sexual harassment case, $250,000, the maximum allowable under our statute, with an additional for over $400,000 in damages to the complainant. In December 2017, almost one year ago, the Commission held a citywide public hearing on sexual harassment in the workplace. We heard testimony from a diversity of industries, from workers in the construction industry, domestic workers, restaurant workers, um, to the fashion, modeling, and film industries. We heard from workers, advocates, and government officials about what we, as the administration, could do differently or do better to combat sexual harassment. It was a powerful night where over 100 people converged from across the five boroughs and some traveling up from DC to listen to people's experiences enduring, fighting, challenging, and overcoming sexual harassment. And earlier this year in April, the commission issued a report reflecting on the themes of the testimony and making specific, specific policy recommendations on how the city and the commission can better combat sexual harassment across industry sec sectors and communities of workers. In June, the mayor signed a package of bills that strength strengthens the city human rights laws already broad protections with respect to sexual harassment in the workplace and creates additional responsibilities for employers with respect to educating and training staff on their rights. The commission will be launching a dedicated gender-based harassment unit with attorneys who specialize in gender-based harassment cases very shortly. The commission engages in strategic business outreach so that businesses know their obligations and responsibilities under the city human rights law. With respect to these new requirements on sexual harassment, the commission is in the process of visiting every business improvement district in New York City, which represents over 85,000 businesses, to distribute the mandated Know Your Rights materials created by the commission to as many businesses as possible. The commission has worked with SBS to distribute information about the new laws on their bid list serve and has provided information about the new legislation to chambers of commerce and other business associations throughout the city. Commission staff regularly speak before business associations, um, to employers and to bar associations on the new legal requirements. The commission has a dedicated web page on sexual harassment with FAQs and materials for employers on the new sexual harassment requirements available for download. If an employer or business owner ha ever has a question about compliance or best practices, they can email my team directly and a member of the policy team will respond to them within 24 hours. The commission is working in collaboration with her sister agencies and with the Office of Nightlife to make sure this, avail this information is available to the nightlife industry and to ensure that businesses know how to access the commission and its resources. In addition, the commission provides free live in-person training on sexual harassment in the workplace and offers it to businesses, nonprofit organizations, and other associations upon request. And the commission will launch a free online interactive training on sexual harassment in the workplace in 2019 that will meet, meet both the state and city requirements for mandated sexual harassment training. It is important to note that sexual assault and sexual harassment are two distinct and separate things, although they can often overlap. Sexual harassment is a concept most commonly rooted in the principle of gender discrimination in the workplace, which is addressed through civil rights laws, like the New York City human rights law, and through civil actions, like the ones that the commission can, in, can initiate. By contrast, sexual assault is most commonly addressed through criminal law enforcement. Sexual harassment and sexual assault may occur at the same time, or sexual harassment may lead to sexual assault, but sexual harassment does not always involve a sexual assault. The administration's commitment to address these issues is also reflected in Executive Order 36, which Mayor Bill de Blasio signed in September, and which expands the authorities and responsibilities of the Mayor's Office to Combat Domestic Violence and changed its name to the Office to End Domestic and Gender-Based Violence. The new office will continue to develop and coordinate a citywide response to intimate partner and family violence and now has expanded authority to address gender-based violence, which includes sexual assault, stalking, and trafficking. By creating this office, 
um, we as the administration are continuing to respond to the voices of survivors and advocates and recognizing the need for a system-wide coordinated approach to these issues. The new office will seek to implement best practices and policies, develop and strengthen services and intervention initiatives, enhance coordination across agencies and disciplines, and employ methods for data and information sharing. The office will continue to operate the New York City Family Justice Centers and the Domestic Violence Fatality Review Committee, and will now operate the Advisory Committee to review individual case-level data on domestic and gender-based fatalities. The Commission, along with um, the support of our sister agencies like the Office to End Gen Domestic and Gender-Based Violence and the Office of Nightlife, along with the Department of Consumer Affairs, is deeply committed to combating and addressing sexual harassment in the workplace and to educating businesses on their responsibilities in creating harassment-free spaces. For these reasons, we support the goals of intros 1185 and 1186 and look forward to working with the City Council to ensure they align with or enhance our current efforts. Thank you for... Um, for calling today's hearing on these important issues, and we look forward to your questions. Thank you so much for all your testimony. Uh, before I start asking questions, uh, I'd like to give the floor to my colleagues if they have any. Um, <clears throat> the nightlife, when were you in Queens? It's <laughs> <laughs> um, <clears throat> a good question, in October. And where were you? We were at the LaGuardia <coughs> College. Because I never got notice that you were there. Um, I'm surprised to hear that and sorry to hear that. I'm quite certain that the uh, staff members that I had for community and industry outreach was, were sure to reach out to all elected officials as well as community boards and precincts. So it's possible that perhaps it arrived at your office but unfortunately didn't make it to you which is unfortunate and we will make sure that you are contacted in the future how many people attended the hearing in queens we had a very robust um out you know coming out there i don't have the exact numbers with me uh 75. Oh, 95, sorry. 95 people? Yes, and it was a cross-section of nightlife operators, <coughs> employees, patrons, as well as residents. And you don't know the breakdown of the residents compared to... I do have those numbers, and I can get them to you <coughs> right after. I would appreciate that. Most definitely. We felt pretty good about the turnout and the representation, the diverse representation there. Okay, thank you. Councilmember Cook. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, I have a question for uh, our night life mayor. Right? <laughs> yeah, because quality of life is really important in uh, almost everywhere. And in my district, uh, we have a, a, a place called Skyview, right there, which is um, many apartments, like maybe six uh, condominium buildings uh, over there. Um, and many of them, they always, in the past, always complain about noise. Now, the noise not come, f come from my district, but from the neighborhood district, which is not, not far away. Uh, you know where Cityville is? Near Cityville, there's a junk yard. There's a big junk yard. And uh, very often, over, uh, through social media or something like that, they hold big uh, parties there. And after they... 10 o'clock and so on and so So you create a lot of noise. Now the noise can be heard miles away. Even at Bayside, they can hear it. You know. And they, they couldn't figure out where the noise is coming from. But finally, they figure out it's from, from their place. But they don't do parties every night, right? But when they often, especially in the summertime. You know. So I want you to take a note into this and coordinate with the police department. Uh, because there are two prisons uh, in Corona District, there's a police. But the people complain is usually from uh, my district, which comes you know, comes to the Flushing district or Bayside, you know, uh, because the noise come all the way from Corona to the over there. Uh, so I hope in the future we take a note when whenever there's uh, s s complaint coming in, we, I will let you know. You coordinate with the, the PD and other agencies to make sure you shut down all those uh, illegal parties. You know, thank you. Thank you for bringing that to my attention. Um, 
along those lines, what 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 are in, in your tour? Right, you've done three boroughs so far: Brooklyn, Queens, mm-hmm. Staten Island. You're doing the Bronx this week. Yes. Thursday. On Thursday. Thursday. Um, what what are the most most common complaints you're hearing, or from well, yeah, most common complaints from from um, uh, venue owners and also the community? Well, thank you for your question. Um, as I mentioned, we're really very pleased with the diversity of the turnout and there is a cross-section of concerns from industry to community. When it comes to the industry, we've heard um, sort of concerns regarding enforcement and uh, city agency regulation, cost of doing business, and then when it comes to the community, of course, there's the quality of life concerns. Uh, have are any of the or, or from from the information you're gathering, uh, do you believe that uh, there is an opportunity uh, to help address all of those issues in a way that would be balanced towards the communities and and the businesses? From what I've seen um, in just the production and creation of the listening tours and how um, the interest that we have received from city agencies as well as the community, I definitely get a sense of um, enthusiasm and cooperation and creative thinking that I believe will be conducive to addressing these issues. And just to kind of go back to Karen's concern about certain communities feeling as if they weren't invited to the listening tours is a- after the tours are over. Have you has your office given any thought of the possibility to go into different community boards uh, through the lifetime of the office? Absolutely, I think that of course the five borough listening tour is something that was legislatively mandated. However, I see. Um, really part of the job description is an ongoing and consistent listening tour. We will never stop listening. We reach out to people from within the industry and community, and we've had small and large meetings, and we'll continue to do so in every corner of every borough to ensure that everyone feels heard. Have you had conversations with other council members? about issues in their own districts or like or introduction of meetings, getting to know what Absolutely. I receive calls all week long from city council members, community boards, precincts regarding just general meet and greets or specific issues regarding venues and we're happy to address them always. Does you, does your office currently have the capacity to um, uh, get information out? to venues or to community members? It have, has your office started working on any materials or things of that nature that are helpful or conducive to, to the businesses? Well, um, we've been in office for about nine months now, and we have been laying down frameworks and foundation in order to uh, begin to establish some Um, initiatives and proposals. Right now we're (coughs) focusing primarily on the listening tour um, to inform us to ensure that we have our priorities in order in order to address the things that are most important. Okay. So uh, how many people are on your staff currently? Or how many people are are part of the office? Well, as you know, we're within the Mayor's Office of Media and Entertainment, and the Office of Nightlife currently has three other staff members included, plus me. Okay, great. Um, Speaking on harassment, one of the bills would would require you to post information on the potential website that that you will be creating. Is there a timeline on, on when that website will be launched? We don't currently have a timeline, but from what we've heard from the industry um, and as well as all stakeholders, this is something that would provide a lot of relief and direction for information and it is a a priority for us to, once the town halls are over, to begin the process. So would the website also be a a, 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 a venue for for folks, whether they be business owners or community members to be able to also log in complaints or or just any other inquiries or for information? Well, thank you for asking. Um, 
I don't see the Office of Nightlife as an enforcement or reporting uh, office. However, being the liaison that we are between NYPD and 311, that um, we will utilize the website in order to direct people not only for ways of reporting complaint, but also for alternative routes of mediation and education and support in order to help better address the source of complaint through other means. So, what, so do you have access to 301 complaints and the data behind that? We have been in conversations with 311 in developing a custom uh, platform for us to be able to monitor the top concerns and calls that are coming in so that we best know where to put our, our attention and resources. Okay, great. Um, yeah, the, the, so my question is now to the Commission on Human Rights. Um, ha have you started conversations with the Office of Nightlife around harassment in general? We have, actually. Um, we've, we've been in touch around um, issues of concern for um, venue owners and employers around how to ensure that they are meeting the existing mandates under the law, ways that we can be transparent about what the requirements are, and, um, and in fact creating programming specifically to issues that come up in nightlife, not specific, you know, in addition to sexual harassment, but all, a host of other issues that might come up under the city human rights law as well. Do you have data on, on the prevalence of, of sexual harassment at night compared to the day? I, we don't have uh, data. We focus our, so the, the vast majority of the complaints on sexual harassment occur in the context of the workplace, which obviously would include nightlife institutions as, a, as an employer um, in the workplace context. Um, I don't have specific numbers on how many complaints we have from workers in that industry, but I could see if we can collect that and share that with you if that would be useful to you. Do you have any suggestions on how the city can help prevent patient to patient harassment? Or is the office looking to make any suggestions to the Office of Nightlife? We have explored, and I think there was um, uh, you know, a, a real increase in the desire across all different, many different contexts to um, educate folks on, on bystander intervention and de-escalation tactics. And so we saw that increasingly in the past couple years, even with respect to you know, bias and acts of discrimination that occur on the streets, in public places. Um, and so we've partnered with different organizations that provide bystander intervention training to um, to host those trainings for community members. And so that, I think, is, is an area that we um, continue to find to be very um, fruitful. And we, we would hap happily collaborate with the Office of Nightlife um, and the organizations that do bystander intervention training quite well um, to get those trainings out. It, it bothers me that 90, and it, they were all wearing constituents that came out, that only, you had 95 people which consisted of um, it, it, people that owned businesses, nightlife businesses. I mean, Queens has 2.5 million people. And if, out of that, if 50 of them came to complain, to me, that's not enough. We're not reaching out, you know, further into the communities. And having it in the LaGuardia Community College, which I love dearly, is not Queens. It's not good for people that live in Southeast Queens or live all the way out in Bayside or, or places where they don't have transportation, they don't have subways, they have to take buses, and it would take them like maybe two hours to get to LaGuardia College. If you can, when you do this, have it more centralized where everybody can get to it that wants, because I know for a fact that we have a lot of complaints about nightlife and you know, noises, and I think it would be much better if you could reach out to the people that have the complaints and to listen to them, you know, coming out in the street at night, late at night, and in, in residential areas, 
and you know carrying on like it was uh, two o'clock in the afternoon and you know th these are problems I know in my office I get calls constantly about this going on drinking coming out with drinks in the street you know carrying on years ago what they used to have is different agencies coming out like I used to have in my in my council district a place in Jamaica that all bad things were happening and you had the consumer affairs you had the department of buildings you had different departments coming out and going in there at night when all this was going on and many of the this particular place was closed down because there was a lot of things happening inside so <clears throat> I think we have to reach out more into the communities. And, and like I said, LaGuardia College, love of LaGuardia College, but that's not, that's the beginning of Queens. Thank you for um, bringing up this concern and I can understand um, how you would feel that way. Um, this is the first of many meetings. Um, we have had others before and we'll have many after um, in order to execute what was required through legislation. We did our best to find the most centrally located um, venues that could accommodate the uh, listening tour and I feel as though it was a relatively good representation um, not only for complaints, but also for idea sharing and partnership building. Um, and that has been really the goal of the listening tour is to have a new approach to listen to concerns, but also to come up with creative solutions and for all stakeholders to hear each yeah, other. I understand, but it's hard for me to believe that if, 90, if 95 people were in, in attendance and Queens has, like I said, 2.3 million, 5 million, and only 95 was there. Mm -hmm. I don't feel that Queens was really represented. You know, that's, I, hear I you. mean, that's my feeling. Again, this is the first <clears throat> of many. After this tour, we will be going out, meeting at community boards and- that, Well, that's the community yes. boards. If you go to each individual community board, that is a good thing. I'd also like to add that pe there have been people from many different boroughs attending other meetings as well, and even in the upcoming Bronx and Manhattan meeting, we do anticipate people from all boroughs to attend, and they were, they were invited to and welcome to do so. Um, and we have also created an email address, uh, nightlifeatmedia.nyc.gov, for people who were not able to attend the meetings for whatever reason to also submit their testimony. But I would like to assure you that moving forward, we will be throughout Queens and the last thing they will feel is unheard. Okay, thank you. Thank, thank you, Karen. And yeah, just, just to just reiterate what uh, Ariel is saying, uh, the bill that we passed uh, did require the office to do one town hall uh, in each borough uh, as, as its first um, assignment in order for us to get an idea of what's happening in, within, within uh, different communities. Uh, but just to kind of push on Karen's point, it's important that that's an ongoing, I think, effort, right? Just continually listening to different community boards, making sure that uh, different neighborhoods within those boroughs also get, get the opportunity to continue talking to the office and, um, and um, expressing what, what they feel the office should be doing to help ease uh, 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 concerns within those communities. We look forward to yeah. it. Peter? Cool. Yeah. Council member? Thank you, yeah. So I want to echo the same thing like, uh, our council member uh, Karen Costa just said. Like, you know, I, I didn't hear too much about your office and when your first town hall, uh, we didn't know too much about it until like, I'm now. Yeah. So I hope in the future, uh, you will do more to outreach our community. Uh, my community has a lot of um, uh, karaoke, right? They open very late, uh, bars, you know. Some restaurants open very late too, until like 2 a.m. or 3 a.m. And 
uh, mo most of them, uh, they are good, they are good uh, operators. Uh, usually, it's not the operator that cause problems. It's the, uh, and usually the customers. Customers, they have too much to drink or, or do other things. Or they're too high or they go on the street and they yell and they, com they make noise. And they, uh, sometimes they even urinate, you know, in front of other people's properties, you know. So that's the complaint I always get. So my question to you is, like, what do these people call? I mean, instead of calling the police, they call your office? Or, uh, what's your role uh, in terms of a, a citizens' complaint, the residential complaint about nightlife, you know, noise, rowdiness, you know, people, uh, 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 because sometimes uh, a lot of bars that are located uh, underneath apartment buildings. I mean, when they make noise and they were rowdy, uh, people upstairs couldn't sleep. You know, uh, in the past they called three one one. So from now on, they they can call your office. So <laughs> uh, you guys can be the middleman to solve the problems for them. Well, thank you for your question, and I just want to reassure you that quality of life concerns as well as safety is a top priority for the Office of Nightlife as well as the administration. As far as reporting and enforcement, that is not my understanding of the primary goal of this office. What we are is a liaison between the industry, the residential community, as well as city agencies. And our purpose is to take a look at the holistic problems and systemic issues and to be able to utilize the relationships that we have with the sister agencies to work in concert with each other and to be able to address these issues um, with multi-agency partnerships, creative solutions, thinking outside the box, um, up until now, there has not been a central point of contact in order to orchestrate these resources. And I believe the creation of the office and our role will help to dispatch the existing resources in a better and more effective way. So, so, so my question is, uh, can you tell us uh, uh, under what circumstances we should call you, maybe the steps that we should call uh, customer, when they have complained about noise and rowdiness and wood urination, all these things, they should call free one first and then they call the office later? Or what's, what's the steps? Well, I think if it's a question of safety, they should always call 911 first. Uh -huh, okay. And if it is a question of quality of life complaint, then 311 would be the right resource. We are working with 311. Um, in regards to how to better use it as a tool and to provide different options such as mediation, which I don't think is something that um, has really been readily available. So to be able to, and actually at our town halls, in addition to all of the city and state agencies that are represented, we have also provided free um, mediation services uh, that is already available in each borough for neighbors as well as operators to be able to utilize this service to create understandings and agreements amongst themselves to improve their quality of life. The time to call the Office of Nightlife is, I think, would be when there are chronic issues and when council members or other electeds or community boards find that all other routes have not maybe resulted in the conclusion that they were hoping for. Okay, thank you. Thank you, and thank you for ans answering that. I was actually gonna ask about the chronic complaints and whether or not our uh, council member offices can call you about trying to figure out a, a larger kind of uh, plan of how to deal with, you know, with these bigger issues. So, yeah, great. Um, so not to my favorite topic, and it's uh, DIY spaces and cultural spaces. Um, have you been hearing from them uh, in at, at these town halls at, uh, in different boroughs or is, you know is it mostly concentrated in, in one borough have you been hearing in Staten Island or in Queens about DIY spaces existing and the need for assistance into becoming legal spaces or getting uh, help in making sure that that uh, they're able to um, continue operating 
Well, thank you for bringing it up. I know that it is uh, an issue near and dear to your heart and part and parcel, part of what created the Office of Nightlife. Um, and it is also a very important issue for the Office of Nightlife, not only safety, but vibrancy of underground communities. And to answer your question, yes, we have heard from them in all, fi in all three boroughs so far, including Staten Island. And this is a new office, and we are taking the opportunity through these town halls to listen to these stakeholders and to hear what their needs are, as well as to work with our sister agencies to see how we can best support the vibrancy and safety of the do-it-yourself underground community. Has there any been? Has there any been? Has there have any thought? Has any thought? Sorry, has any thought <laughs> been given around uh, creating a liaison that would focus on the DIY community? Uh, you know, as as you mentioned, their their issues are uh, a lot more unique than uh, than a venue that than a fully operated legal venue. Uh, I believe that they also um, cater to. Uh, a, a different uh, community that, that has other uh, other uh, special needs that other that that above ground venues do not have. Has there any thought any thought in your office to to hire someone or to appoint someone? Um, well, there has been a lot of thought to this and many issues. And for now, I consider myself the liaison for the DIY community in the city. Um, and again, where I think. The best approach is to take advantage not only of the listening tours, but this time as we're establishing the office to really hear from the community and to hear what their needs are and then to work with the sister agencies to see how we can best support them to ensure safety while they're on the road to legitimacy as well. Um, how, what's your vision, what's, what has been your interaction with NYPD and uh, March, the March task force in general? Um, ha, have you had any productive conversations about one how they how they how they end up being deployed into certain venues or communities? Uh, about how uh, venues and and can avoid uh, being um, targeted by March, or how the city can just reform. Uh, the way March is is uh, deployed in, into certain venues? I have had many conversations, not only with NYPD, but other agencies that are deployed during March. And this is a conversation that is on the table, and there is a lot of um, willingness and desire to improve what has already in, in, in the, the, the perspective of the city agencies have been on the road to improving and a continued effort to, to improve the way that they are dispatched and also on the efforts before the dispatch of March on outreach and education and support and mediation. And I believe there's a multi-agency um, interest in, in doing that as well. Yeah, so uh, I'm, sh I'm sure you're aware I have a bill with uh, Councilman Steve Levin that will increase transparency. Uh, has there been any conversation over uh, you being able to have uh, access to, to information on how, how and when March is deployed or any conversation around um, you being able to intervene before March actually is, is, is deployed into a venue? We are in conversation and we will continue to discuss with the sister agencies on the best way to work together in order to support the industry um, and to, to allow it to be supported as best as possible. Okay, I just also wanna mention we've been joined by Councilmember Chin from Lower Manhattan. Sorry, my last question for you, Ariel. Okay. Um, in the bill, it, it also mentions that the office and also the advisory board should should come up with a policy report uh, to submit to the mayor's to the mayor's office and to the city council, outlining um, uh, all of the policy recommendations that that the city council and the mayor should take on in order to 
help create a more vibrant nightlife in New York City. Uh, I want to acknowledge that the office was uh, delayed when it comes to when when it first came to your hiring and the opening of the office. Uh, I, I believe the bill calls for this report to be released 18 months after the bill was passed. Is there uh, any timeline updates on when we could be ex expecting that sort of report? I would not be able to give you a timeline update on that right now, but we can. I can return to our office and get a better assessment of the reality of what that might look like. Okay, I'm anxiously waiting. Looking forward to it too. Um, any other questions from my colleagues? No. Thank you. Thank you. DCA had a easy time today. Okay. It's always an easy time here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we get along. Thank you for the Th opportunity. Thank you for testifying, and it was exciting to hear all of the great work you're doing, and I'm excited to hear um, what the future holds for the office. So Me thank too. you. Thank you so much. And I'll see you in the Bronx. Okay, yeah. yes. Up next, we have Emily May from Hollaback, Christina Ortiz from New York City Alliance Against Sexual Assault. We have Andrew Riggi from New York City Hospitality Alliance, and we have Joanna Alvarez from Black Women's Blueprint. Um, before you begin, just state your name um, for the record, and you have three minutes on the clock. Okay, um, hi, I'm Tiffany Catan, and I'm from Hollowback. No, you could start. Oh, once, okay, once, yeah, great. yeah. <laughs> okay. Just make sure you say your name before you, you give your. Okay. Uh, mm -hmm. Good afternoon, and thank you for the opportunity to provide testimony on behalf of Hollowback. Uh, my name is Tiffany Catant, speaking on behalf of Emily May, who is the co-founder and executive director at Hollaback. Um, just a quick note, Emily apologizes for being unable to attend. She's moving today. Hollaback is a global people-powered movement to end harassment in all its forms. Since 2011, we have trained over 15,000 people on how to intervene when they see harassment happening in public spaces, including nightlife establishments. In 2014, our Hollaback team in London launched the Good Night Out campaign to provide bystander intervention training in nightlife establishments. And the training has scaled to over 20 cities around the world, including Melbourne and Vancouver. In May, we partnered with the NYC Human Rights Commission to integrate best practices for my bystander intervention training into their sexual harassment training in the workplace, which has been scaled citywide. As part of the training, the NYC Human Rights Commission recommends employers hire Hollaback if they wish to train their teams further in the area of bystander intervention. We have trained government institutions like the NYPD and the NYC Department of Sanitation, civic organizations like the Brooklyn Public Library and New York Immigration Coalition, and corporations like Lyft and Voxed. In regards to our recommendations, as leaders in the field of bystander intervention, we endorse the bills proposed today, and we are grateful to the leadership of the council for bringing them forward. We recommend training security guards on techniques for responding with sensitivity to shock and trauma, which will specifically target how to respond with sensitivity to shock and trauma and the measures that an employee must take to address the report of harassment. We recommend that the signage posted should note that the security guards have been trained to receive complaints and intervene in situations of harassment and use the language you will be believed, which has demonstrated a positive impact on reporting by overcoming this common reason that people do not report. We recommend training of 311 and 911 operators on how to effectively respond to harassment and ensure this resource is posted on the public signage. Lastly, we recommend funding for the Office of Nightlife to develop a high quality e-learning training with the purpose with the proposed the purpose in the fiscal year of 2019 to 2020 budget. We recommend um, the council allocate at least $150,000 during this purpose with the budget. 
Thank you for your leadership on addressing harassment in all its forms for all New Yorkers. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Christina Ortiz, and I'm the Senior Prevention Coordinator at the New York City Alliance Against Sexual Assault. Thank you to the Committee of Consumer Affairs and Business Licensing for allowing us to address you in these hearings. The Alliance is a citywide umbrella organization that strives to prevent sexual assault and support survivors. It does this by addressing gaps in sexual prevention and intervention in underserved communities, providing technical assistance to hospitals programs and programs on their response to sexual assault, and delivering trainings to social service agencies, hospitals, medical providers, bar and nightlife staff, college campus communities, youth, and more. The Alliance has spent over 10 years working collaboratively with various stakeholders to engage nightlife in sexual violence prevention. Several high-profile cases of sexual violence between 2006 and 2010 demonstrated the role of bystanders and nightlife employees can play in making establishments safer and more patron-friendly. An increasing number of nightlife industry professionals acknowledge the need to combat sexual violence as part of venue security, patron safety, and responsible nightlife services. In response to this, a coalition of advocates, service providers, and law enforcement called the Manhattan Multidisciplinary Sexual Assault Task Force created a subcommittee to address the issue of sexual assault and nightlife. This subcommittee included the New York County District Attorney's Office, the Alliance, New York City Hospitality Alliance, Crime Victim Treatment Center, and Mount Sinai Beth Israel. The New York City Hospitality Alliance and CBTC as a first step in collaboration with the Sexual Violence Prevention and Response Program at Columbia University and Manhattan Sexual Assault Task Force conducted focus groups with venue owners, staff, and patrons. These focus groups indicated a gap in knowledge regarding what constitutes sexual violence, the laws related to sex crimes, best practices for evidence preservation, and most importantly, safe intervention techniques. Nightlife venues were eager to support trained management and staff equipped with the necessary skills to intervene safely and prevent situations that could lead to sexual violence. The employees of these establishments also expressed interest in being part of a workplace that is free of sexual aggression. Uh, aggression. Based on these focus groups, the subcommittee pursued a two-pronged approach, on-premise training for nightlife establishments and the creation of a coalition that could lead prevention efforts in the nightlife arena. Three rape crisis programs, CBTC, Bellevue, and Mount Sinai Beth Israel, along with the Alliance, launched a citywide collective that would engage expertise from, expertise from nightlife community and serve as an incubator of the nightlife staff training. This coalition came to be called Outsmart NYC. With regard to the legislative proposals that are subject of these hearings, the Alliance would like to make two recommendations. Um, first, with respect to Resolution 580, which recommends the addition of sexual assault intervention and prevention training to security guards, we would like to recommend more expen expansive additions, including recognizing and responding safely to int intimate partner violence, de-escalation techniques, conflict resolution, and responding to situations when drugs and alcohol are involved. Oh, okay. Um, we urge the council to consider the development of a subcommittee of the Nightlife Advisory Board that would examine the current curriculum and the needs of the communities in which the guards work to make a recommendation regarding up -to -dates, updates in this curriculum. Thank you. We, we're grateful to the Committee on Consumer Affairs and Business Licensing for tackling these important issues. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair, council members. My name is Andrew Ridgey. I am the executive director of the New York City Hospitality Alliance. I am also a council appointee of the Nightlife Advisory Board and the chair. However, I am- Congratulations. Thank you. Uh, I am testifying in my capacity uh, with the New York City Hospitality Alliance. Um, so it's been uh, uh, discussed, you know, we have been supportive of many efforts to address uh, sexual harassment and assault within the hospitality industry. We had worked uh, together with our colleagues at the uh, Sexual Assault Alliance, uh, Outsmart New York, and others uh, on a bystander curriculum. We supported the Stop Sexual Harassment Act in New York City. Uh, we've also worked with the NYPD on developing our groundbreaking best practices for nightlife establishments, which addresses what to do in cases of sexual assault and reporting it. Um, I'm not saying that all of these initiatives are enough. We need to continue to do more. However, we believe both intro 1185 and resolution 580 uh, can be uh, slightly amended to make sure that they are both fair uh, to all and effective. Uh, so first, I want to address who is covered by the bills and what is required. Recently, both the state of New York and the city of New York passed 
two different but similar anti-harassment trainings that focuses more on uh, within the workplace, but not focused on patrons. Uh, however, they do include provisions to address bystander intervention, uh, which is, of course, uh, consumer or patron facing. Uh, with this new bill, uh, 1185, it would create a third class called a nightlife establishment, which would have to uh, provide additional anti-harassment uh, training to employees. So while they are not identical trainings, they do overlap, although they don't fully overlap, and that's something that needs to be um, discussed because requiring employees to take two sets of trainings annually and an employer to take or make two uh, sets of records annually creates quite a burden and certainly will create uh, compliance issues um, for the industry. Basically, we need a worker to be able to take one anti-harassment training, uh, and it should satisfy both city and state uh, requirements. Uh, also, the definition in this bill that creates this third class calls it a nightlife establishment. We have some real concerns about that. Uh, that uh, definition was created in the city charter uh, to establish the office of nightlife. Uh, we were, you know, there with those negotiations, those discussions, and that was clearly a broad and somewhat vague definition of a nightlife establishment to ensure that the office could address issues within nightlife, DIY spaces, restaurants, and any other type of uh, uh, entertainment venue. It was not intended to be a uh, a definition which statutory requirements and penalties would then be extended. So that is uh, one issue. It's not a technical definition uh, and it should be changed. We also think that these types of issues occur not just in nightlife establishments, they occur at gyms, dentist office, anywhere where commercial activity can occur. So we do believe this bill should be expanded to address and training within all industries, not just the nightlife industry. And if you bear with me for two more moments, yeah, take your uh, time. just wanted to address a couple other um, uh, matters. Uh, when it comes to the posted sign, um, I mean, while it's not overly burdensome, um, certainly uh, a lot of business owners feel that there's been a lot of gotcha violations and summonses issued. And we were talking about reform, especially when it comes to the marked uh, task force. Uh, we presume that another sign, whether it's defaced, improperly posted, not posted at all, will just add to another type of nitpicky violation that we're trying to get away from. So that's something that we think should be further discussed with the advocates, because if there is evidence showing that it does have a positive impact on people who have been uh, harassed or assaulted. We want to address that, but we don't need to create an additional uh, burden if it's uh, not necessary. But we certainly have participated uh, and support the voluntary programs people have done. Uh, and the resolution 580 that calls on the state of New York to update its uh, security guard training. We have been supportive for years of reforming that training. Uh, right now, if you are a security guard in a bar or a nightclub, you take the same training as a security guard in a pharmacy. Clearly, the environment is much different. Uh, we believe this is a good start, but the training should be more expansive to focus on issues like de-escalation, dealing with overdoses, uh, intoxicated patrons, unfortunately also active shooter situations as we recently saw. So we think it's a good start. And our final comment on that would just be the language. We do think the language of the resolution uh, paints a quite negative context of nightlife at a time when we're trying to embrace it. So we think we can address the seriousness of the issue, um, but in a manner that doesn't paint nightlife in a uh, negative light. So we really thank you for, uh, you know, for your leadership on these nightlife issues, your consideration of our comments, and we hope to work together uh, so this, these bills and resolution can basically work for everyone. Good afternoon, council members. My name is Joanna Alvarez, and I'm representing Black Women's Blueprint. Thank you for the invitation, invitation to give testimony on the issue of bystander intervention in favor of intro 1185 and 1186. 
Black Women's Blueprint was founded in 2008, and it works to place black women and girls lives and struggles squarely within the context of larger racial justice concerns and is committed to building movements where gender matters and social justice organizing so that all members of black communities achieve social, political, and economic equity. The story of Janice Towson Jackson, a 29-year-old mother of three who was killed in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania at a local bar for rejecting a man's advances shouts to a national anthem of black women and girls across this country that saying no is not a human right. Janice's resistance was fatal. Black women con continue to face a death penalty for saying no, embodying their own personal agency and exercising bodily autonomy. The boundaries we set as black women continue to draw blood. Could this woman's life have been safe if bystander intervention was implemented? As yet another black woman is slain openly and publicly, we have to send different messages to black women and girls bearing witnesses to these tragedies. We have to dismantle misogyny and patriarchy that lives between our sheets, sits at the corner in the bars of our neighborhood businesses, lurks in our parks, and steals the innocence of the young women that walk through them at night. To where do we run when the parks foster a culture of rape during the hours of recreation? Black women are assaulted at all times of the day in plain sight of the community. Janice's story sends a message to black women everywhere. You can be killed for your resistance, your autonomy, your femininity, and your blackness. There is a risk in bystander intervention, and innocent bystanders also fear for their lives in those moments of advocacy. We need strategies concerning misogyny, interracial, and sexual violence. We must center community and systematic accountability for the protein protection of our women. Prevention, recognizing that few resources exist that are culturally relevant and focus on preventing rape and sexual assault before it occurs. We develop innovative programs focused on identifying and preventing sexual violence before it occurs. The Training Institute delivers prevention, education, curricula based on an understanding of the complex interplays between the individual, relational, social, cultural, and environmental, historical, and persistent structural fractures that influence the spectrum of discrimination, oppression, and violence that impacts people's lives. Intervention, we specialize in liberatory bystander intervention models, transformative and healing models, as well as asset-based community accountability models. Using proven effective pedagogy and methodologies, the Institute works to equip people, groups, and other organizations with a framework for developing strategies anchored in civil and human rights as key points for intervention. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for all the testimony. Um, it's really uh, enlightening and encouraging to hear about all the work you're all doing. Uh, question, so do, do you all actively work with, with nightlife establishments to some degree or have worked with nightlife establishments to help institute some of the ideas you have? Yes. Yeah. yes. And what, what has the relationship been like? So the history of the Alliance is building Outsmart NYC, which you'll hear from some um, other members who are here today to testify. Um, and that is building a curriculum to educate them on bystander intervention and help them realize that the skills that they already have and that they're already using and just help them become more comfortable with that. And what have been some of the best practices that you see that work and are easy for establishments to take on? Yeah, any of you can answer, it's fine. Okay. Yeah. Well, what I've noticed through some of the trainings is that they, they, they're already doing the work, mm -hmm. um, and we're just there to help them realize that they're already doing the work. A lot of them, they're working together as teams. They have policies. They have procedures, um, and, and they just need to become more comfortable with it. And w we've, we've also noticed is, is recognizing that something is happening is the first step to bystander intervention, and also realizing that you don't do anything um, if you're gonna put yourself in harm. So that's why nightlife is is, is key to, they, they're already an established team, so they're already able to dis do this work, and they're already doing the work. So we don't give them enough credit, and I think that's part of the problem. Well, th Andrew, um, thank you uh, for testifying. Um, I, I think you brought up many valid points, and we're going to work with you closely to make sure this is a bill that works for everyone. Uh, I think we share the same common goal, and I also appreciate uh, you mentioning that we should also expand, um, you know, the type of businesses that we're covering uh, around this conversation. Um, for example, like the gym, I thought that was a great um, recommendation as well. Um, 
do you do, are there are there businesses within your organization that are already working with 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 groups like Hollaback? Uh, yes, well, with with Outsmart uh, and, and the Alliance, we work closely and had many different focus groups: uh, patron focused, uh, worker focused, from you know the bar back and busser to security. Um, and there was a lot of interesting things that came out of it. I think what we see happening is often people are engaging in some sort of bystander activity but may not actually know it. Two things that pop up in my head were just if you see two people that come in separately and you see them leaving together and one of them seems intoxicated, the person at the door simply asking them and someone else can step in if I'm mm -hmm. incorrect, but you know, simply asking them if you can help them get a taxi you know, provides them an opportunity to take an out if they don't want to leave with a person. Um, so, you know, there's little things, again, that we kind of just do that we may not recognize. And I think it's been successful. We've gotten really positive feedback um, from the business owners that we've worked with on this. And I think going through some of the trainings was quite insightful for a lot of the workers. Um, and it also empowers them in a sense that they are the eyes and the ears of a business, even if they are at one of the entry-level positions. They have a role in keeping the business vibrant and keeping people safe. and having a good time. Do you mind if I say? Okay. Yeah, of course. And ahead. I think it's important when you're creating these laws that has to do with training that we think about the communities that these trainings are going to be in. We're diverse. New York City is a diverse city. We're not a college town. So the, some curriculum that might work in for Rutgers, New Brunswick won't work here. Um, we have to think about um, our LGBT community, our, our non-gender conforming community, our people of color community, and think about why 911 may not be their best their best bet, their best resource. So I think that's, I just want to say, I think it's really important that you all think about that when you're um, creating these laws that has to do with educating communities that aren't so one-dimensional. 100%. And uh, actually, it, this came out of the, for me personally, it was out of the House of Yes, which I know creates a safe space for all different types of communities. And that's really what inspired me to move forward with something like this. Um, but again, I, I look forward to continue having those conversations, seeing how we can make, every, make, make the bills better. I guess my last question is to you, Andrew. Um, one is one one of one of the pieces here is a, is a resolution to the state regarding security guards. Uh, is there anything that establishments can do to, you know, push these security companies to train their workers instead of having legislation come from the top down? There are a few of the security guard companies that work. So let me just start to say, most nightlife establishments that have security do retain an outside third party. Some of them, uh, if they have a few establishments, will employ the actual security. Um, you know, I think some of the nightlife companies are, especially in light with more of the um, uh, active shooter types of situations, have been up updating their curriculums. Um, some of them have focused on some of these um, other issues, but I think obviously it just is going to come to, if not legislation, um, reaching out to them individually and also m bringing more awareness within the industry. We've had members, restaurants, bars that have come to us uh, for different trainings and you know, we've reached a large number of businesses on these subjects, but certainly there's thousands of more businesses that may not be uh, coming to our training. So I think awareness, I think uh, through the Office of Nightlife, certainly there's a great opportunity to be able to provide information, um, getting the best practices guide out to businesses and making sure that they're reviewing it and implement, implement, implementing uh, different strategies and trainings are key. Um, but there's not, I mean, there's a bunch, but there's a couple of key security guard companies that work within the space, and I'd be happy to make a connection and an introduction with some of these other groups as well so we can sit down and talk about what they need to do uh, sans a mandate. Mm -hmm. Do you have any idea how many of these companies exist? I, I don't know how many. I mean, I know that there's three or four off the top of my head that you know work with a lot of uh, different venues, but clearly there's so many venues throughout the city. And frankly, there's also maybe a lot of venues that don't have security. They may just have an employee sitting at the door, so it may look like there are security guards sitting at the front door, but really they're checking IDs, and they're not, you know, quote, unquote, you know, security guard or trained with those types of uh, techniques and provided the experience they need. All right. Thank you. Thank you all. Appreciate it. Thanks for testifying.
up next we have Eric McGriff from Outsmart NYC, Amy Northup from Outsmart NYC, and Chantel Gertis. And forgive me if I mispronounce your name. Jarde. Jarde. Yeah, you may begin. Hello and good afternoon, everyone. My name is Chantal Jourdet, and I'm a trauma therapist and community mobilization strategist with over nine years of experience serving survivors of sexual and intimate partner violence through Mount Sinai Beth Israel's Victim Services Program. We are also a co-founder of Outsmart NYC, which has been mentioned earlier. We are a growing partnership between the nightlife and hospitality industries and programs serving survivors of violence across New York City. We are invested in empowering the nightlife and hospitality industries in preventing sexual violence through prevention education, bystander intervention and crisis response training, community mobilization, and expanding access to supportive services. We want to thank Council Members Espinal, Brannon, Moya, and Levine for your desire to make comprehensive sexual violence prevention and bystander intervention training more accessible to the nightlife and hospitality industries at large. At Outsmart NYC, we believe that nightlife personalities and professionals are uniquely positioned to be city leaders in violence prevention. As such, we are in support of legislation that acknowledges the crucial role that staff have in our safety, as they are indeed the curators of many of our memories and experiences. In the age of Me Too, it is all too easy to want to point the finger at an industry and call it the problem, to other, to other sexual violence as somebody else's issue, because it is much easier to demonize the symptomatic sites rather than address the systemic causes of violence. Sustainable culture change is possible when we build holistic and collaborative relationships between the industries and their surrounding communities to address issues of violence and harm together. As such, we also hope that this legislation can encourage better relationships between operators, community members, and local precincts. Mandating training for an industry that bears witness to some of our most intimate, most joyful, and most liberating moments requires that we prioritize the nuanced needs of this industry and create flexible structures to address them. A club in meatpacking will require much different forms of intervention than, say, a DIY space in Ridgewood or a wine bar in Astoria. This means that in moving forward, the legislation proposed needs to center nightlife's expertise, existing expertise, of what works in their spaces and provides them with the support necessary to mitigate the multitudes of barriers that they face in intervening. Barriers such as job security, health insurance coverage, lost wages, prior victimization, um, lack of supportive management, and much more. It means creating training and tools such as signage and resources that are intersectional and inclusive, recognizing how violence disproportionately impacts people of color, LGBTQI individuals, and undocumented folks. Sexual violence does not happen in a silo, and it is important to recognize um, and it is important to recognize that both the identities of venues and the identities of staff and patrons impacts how safe people feel to intervene and seek support. In our work, we know that many operators and staff want tools but are denied access to effective trauma-informed resources and care. What many people don't realize is that witnessing harm without the capacity or tools to intervene can be incredibly traumatic for staff. Many of the industry professionals that we work with have been deeply impacted by a sense of helplessness when witnessing situations that they recognize as harmful. When we ignore this, we are silencing the very people who are most poised to cut off harm way before it escalates to violence. We ask that in moving forward with any of this legislation, that the committee take into account the expertise of industry professionals, trauma treatment providers, and preventionists. We ask that you all consider how streamlining these trainings rather than creating structures that allow for flexibility to the community being served 
can minimize this impact. We ask that even in the very language of this legislation, as Andrew mentioned, reflect a desire to create sustainable and safe structures tailored to this industry so that they may continue to lead in this very brave and radical culture change for our city. Thank you. Everyone hear me? All right. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Councilman and the Committee on Consumer Affairs. My name is Eric McGriff, and I am the Prevention Coordinator for the Crime Victims Treatment Center and the Director of Training Development for Outs Outsmart NYC. I also sit on the Manhattan Sexual Assault Task Force as the Nightlife Chair. Uh, I've been involved in domestic and sexual violence prevention for over 10 years. And for those of you who may not know, violence prevention is not just a term we throw around. It comes with actual concrete evidence-based principles and strategies that we have to follow in order for that prevention to be effective. And so that's the lens through which I'm giving this testimony as a sexual violence prevention specialist. First, I want to bring to everyone's attention that sexual harassment and sexual assault both fall under the umbrella of sexual violence. We want to eradicate sexual violence in our spaces and using the term sexual violence will allow us to be inclusive of all the attitudes and behaviors we're looking to bring an end to. Second, it is important for us to understand that alcohol and other drugs do not cause violence. If they did, then that means that everyone who consumes them has no choice but to act violently when we all know that isn't true. If we're all going to be truly invested in preventing sexual violence in the nightlife community, then we need to acknowledge that very crucial point. It is important because that very myth has been the source of tremendous shame toward the nightlife community, and shame does not inspire culture change. It, is more often, it more often causes us to not speak up and to handle things internally out of fear, thus maintaining the status quo. It causes individuals or venues to adopt an what happens in the home stays in the home type of mentality. Shame is a tool used to compel submission, especially when supported by such falsehoods. It is only a small percentage of individuals who act violently when drunk. It is the relative few who use alcohol as a weapon to commit sexual assault, and they do it over and over again. Limiting the options of the majority to stop that relative few from perpetrating is akin to the ineffective risk reduction tactics we often tell those who disproportionately, disproportionately experience sexual violence, like women and femme individuals, to use. Things like watch what you wear, watch your drink, don't flirt. These, mes these messages allow us to avoid talking about the actual perpetrator. They, allow, they show us how we are sometimes complicit in sexual violence by keeping the attention off of the perpetrator and for blaming the venue or the alcohol when we may not do so in a DUI case or in a case where someone's maybe wearing a fancy suit and gets robbed. Third, I want to acknowledge that most sexual violence does not happen in nightlife spaces. That is a statistical fact. Number one place for sexual harassment is in public spaces, which is inclusive of nightlife, but not exclusive. The number two is at work, which brings me to my fourth point. Why aren't we talking about sexual violence experienced by staff? Some of the biggest barriers to intervention in nightlife is not knowing how to identify harm before it gets to the physical level or how to intervene, but also not having support of staff or knowing you may have to report to someone who doesn't see it as an issue or doesn't know how to help. Preventing sexual violence becomes especially hard if you are someone who experiences sexual violence from coworkers or management. If a venue is receiving comprehensive prevention and bystander intervention training from an employer who makes it a point to say that sexual violence is not tolerated and is, and is adamant about making resources available, then the staff will feel more empowered to intervene knowing they're supported. I also want to note that sexual assaults mostly do not happen in nightlife spaces or at parties. An overwhelming majority of sexual assaults happen in or around the living quarters of the victim. The grooming is often what happens in nightlife spaces, which further brings to the forefront the important for prevention training. Lastly, I want to acknowledge that prevention has to be specific to the community. It's actually one of the principles of effective prevention programming. We call it sociocultural relevance. Doing so allows communities we engage to personalize and take ownership of the work to prevent and end sexual violence. Having a general mandatory training is a great first step, but will ultimately not be as effective as a training tailored to the community. The industry needs to be held accountable in ways that offers tools and gives opportunities to show up and be collaborative in our interventions. We have those tools here in New York City. Prevention is long-term. It's an ongoing relationship that starts with a conversation and has to be carried out in multiple sessions. Again, effective prevention program strategies. It's trauma-informed. It's l giving education from people who work with survivors, leveraging the expertise of those in the industry, and providing connection to free legal, free medical, three therapeutic services, which we do at Outsmart. 
I'm so glad that the City Council provided us this opportunity to speak, and I look forward to the collaborations that will come because there's definitely a lot of work to be done, and we're moving in the right direction. Thank you. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Amy Runtup, longtime nightlife professional and Altamont facilitator. Oh, yeah, sorry. <laughs> Do I need to do that again? <laughs> Amy Northup, longtime nightlife professional, and is button on. Is it on? <laughs> of course. Hello. This is <laughs> now I think it's working. Yeah. Now you got double. Cool. Take three. <laughs> My name is Amy Northup, a longtime nightlife professional and outsmart facilitator. I am so excited to be speaking on these topics today, and so grateful to the council members for prioritizing sexual violence prevention in nightlife spaces. This is a topic that means a lot to me. By trade, I am an actress and a director, so I've been in hospitality for a long time in New York. About 15 years as a bartender mostly, but I have worked as a waitress and a manager as well. I love nightlife. I love New York City nightlife. I think, frankly, it gives New York its lifeblood. But it's not without problems, and I agree that one of the biggest problems is the prevalence of sexual violence. My colleagues have spoken to a little bit today some of the nuances in the language of the proposed legislation to the definition of sexual violence versus sexual assault or sexual harassment, to what role alcohol plays in facilitating it, not causing it, that is important. They have spoken more specifically to the normalization of sexual violence in nightlife and why nightlife staff may or may not want to intervene. Spoiler alert, we do. We want to be safe doing it and supported by our management, our industry, and our city in doing so. And most importantly, they have spoken to the crucial element of Kimberly Crenshaw's concept of intersectionality in these conversations. I beg you to listen to them closely. These are your experts. I deeply believe, as does Outsmart, that nightlife professionals are uniquely poised to make huge, if not some of the biggest impact in the culture shifts we are so desperately craving in these Me Too moments. We're on the ground. We are the places that the people come to meet and drink and sometimes do drugs, to go on dates and laugh and play and talk and flirt. We are the places that people go to be people. And that is beautiful. It can be messy and sometimes dangerous. It is not by nature inherently violent. Truly, y'all, these spaces are awesome, these spaces that we build to come together. But we do have to be well-trained to handle all of this humanity. We have so much opportunity to intervene, to reduce harm, and to make these spaces that we are all a part of safer. Yes, all. I tell people all the time that everyone is in nightlife. Even if you've never worked in it, if you go to bars, if you go out to eat, if you walk by these places on your way home from a long day, you are part of a nightlife community. And we as communities have to start taking better care of each other, and we have to start holding each other accountable. And we need better tools to do that. We have to start making each other's safety our business. We have to be trained in bystander intervention. It's hard, right? Intervention sounds like a terrifying term. It sounds, at its least scary, like confrontation, which so many of us, understandably, are very adverse to. We love, I don't know, man, it's just not my business. Yes, it is. At Outsmart, we teach people that it doesn't always have to be dramatic or scary. It's actually about de-escalation. Sometimes it's entirely nonverbal, even. It's as simple as checking in, as saying, how y'all doing over there, everything okay? Hint, we already do this as making eye contact or pouring some water. Yeah, you guessed it, we already do this too. This is just about adding the lens of observation and an eye towards sexual violence prevention. It's about checking in on someone when their date goes to the bathroom after overhearing something concerning or seeing something really uncomfortable body language wise. Hey, how's it going over here? I'm, I'm sorry if I'm being nosy, but you seem a little uncomfortable. Am I misreading that? Are you okay? Oh my God, you saw that? Again, we're so used to not naming it to each other that just being seen is really powerful. I'm so relieved. They're really aggressive, right? Yeah, I noticed that. Do you want me to help? Do you want me to help? Because I think I might know how to help. I think so often we don't intervene because we don't know how we would help if we were to. This is what Outsmart does. We facilitate conversations with people who are already experts at what they do, ask them to add the lens of sexual violence prevention, and help them to become experts at that too at maybe handling and maybe helping in these messy gray area situations. I have had some version of that conversation hundreds of times. Sometimes they're weird, sometimes they're easy, sometimes they're super uncomfortable, and sometimes I'm wrong, but I am 100% sure that I have helped people feel empowered to get themselves out of scary situations, that I have helped mobilize someone's friends to get them home safe, that I have kept someone who didn't mean to commit harm from doing so. 
And yes, that I have looked predators in the eye and without saying these exact words said, not in my house and not on my watch. I'm able to do this because I have the tools, because I have made it my priority to make it my business, to create the culture I want to live in in my bars. I've learned from and been trained by the best. I've mobilized my expertise and built resilience for uncomfortable conversations. I have practiced because of Outsmart, because of trainings like this. This legislation, it is crucial. It is not without problems, but it's a really good start. I think it needs some shaping, some fine tuning. I can think it must go deeper. It must center intersectionality. We must name and grapple with not only the existence of potential for violence between our patient patrons, but also between our patrons and ourselves. And we as an industry must have a reckoning with the prevalence of violence amongst ourselves. These things are not inextricable from each other. But we have to be including sexual violence prevention in our nightlife spaces, or we are deeply not doing our jobs as legislators, as nightlife professionals, or as community members. We are the leaders in this work, bartenders, managers, bouncers, yes, please, bouncers. Please help give us the tools to do this work. Thank you. Thank you so much, and thank you for all for your testimony. Very insightful, uh, very helpful. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. It was great, truly. Thank you. Uh, last panel, we have Ginny Lo Lotus and Gilbert Ho Hoover. And again, sorry if I am mis mispronouncing your name. The Lutus, great. May begin. Hi, I'm Gilbert Hoover. Is this on? Yeah, it's on. Yeah, good. I'm Gilbert Hoover. Um, I'm vice president and general counsel of the Schubert Organization, the city's largest owner and operator of Broadway theaters. In addition to owning and operating 17 Broadway theaters and six off-Broadway stages, Schubert operates Telecharge, a leading provider of ticketing services to Broadway and off-Broadway venues. I'm also appearing as a representative of the Broadway League, which is the principal trade association for the commercial theater industry in New York State and across North America for over 80 years. It presently represents more than 750 theater owners, producers, and road presenters nationwide with over 400 offices in uh, New York City. Um, in my written statement, I have information about uh, the impact of the Broadway on the city's economy. In the interest of time, I will skip that. Um, but we would like to thank you, Chairman Espinal, and the other members of the committee um, for uh, uh, holding this meeting and for your ongoing efforts to address consumer protection issues for our city's theater goers and other consumers of entertainment. The League has always encouraged transparency in the ticket purchasing process so that consumers are fully aware of the source of their tickets, the prices of their tickets, and any fees or surcharges that may be imposed prior to purchase. We recently advocated in the state legislature for enhanced consumer protections that include improved market transparency. Under the New York State law um, that was recently passed, Chapter 110 of 2018, which the Broadway League supported, Every operator of a place of entertainment and any ticket reseller will have to disclose in a clear and conspicuous manner the total price of the ticket and how much of the price consists of a service charge before a sale is completed. We feel this language appropriately balances the need for transparency and consumer protection without imposing excessive regulatory constraints on the marketplace. Earlier drafts of the state legislation included language that, like that proposed in Intro 930 and would have required operators to disclose service fees along with the ticket prices in all advertising and promotional materials. However, the state legislature ultimately rejected that language in favor of the above noted disclosure requirement at the point of sale. We agree with the approach taken by the state legislature. We do not think it is practical to require disclosure of all fees and all advertisements or promotions 
as prices and surcharges vary widely by outlet and delivery method. For example, tickets sold at the box office generally have no additional transaction fee. Tickets sold on the web may include different fees depending on whether the tickets are mailed, held at the box office, or printed at home. And tickets sold over the phone will have yet another range of service fees. Managing all of this information and conveying the multitude of possibilities in one disclosure in all advertisements which include pricing information would simply be impracticable. While we're grateful that the City Council continues to take an active interest in the health of the live entertainment industry and is considering affirmative measures to improve the ticketing buying experience, we believe that the newly enacted state law adequately addresses this issue and additional oversight by the City is not required at this time. I thank you for the opportunity and I'm happy to address any questions. Thank you, Chairman Espinal. <clears throat> Good afternoon. My name is Ginny Lalutis and I'm the Executive Director of the Alliance of Resident Theaters New York, the service and advocacy organization for New York City's 400 plus nonprofit theaters in all five boroughs. I'm here today to testify on behalf of proposed legislation that would require my members to disclose service fees charged when purchasing tickets and all promotional materials. When I alerted my membership to this legislation, several expressed their concerns and its impact on their marketing costs. Most of these companies have annual budgets below $2 million. They promote their shows online and via postcards that are about this size. There's a copy of a postcard with every testimony I've attached. Advertising their fees will require anywhere from one sentence to one paragraph, depending upon the range of ticket prices. This could require larger postcards, higher printing costs, money they can ill afford. For our largest theater companies, such as those who have theaters on Broadway and off, there are additional concerns. One company already includes information on their fees on direct mail and email outreach created for their shows, but they don't list this information on their ads since it would require additional space. Now let me show you, this is the today's ABCs. The only theater that is a nonprofit theater listed in here under Off-Broadway is Lincoln Center Theater, under Broadway is Roundabout. They're the two largest theaters in the country. They have small ads because this ad is about $7,000 a day. None of them list ticket prices, by the way, because they can't afford the line. It's $1,000 a line. So if they have to list all their ticket prices and all the fees and all the different, different categories of which they fall, the ad would look more like this one, which is by the richest producer on Broadway, which is why he can do what he does. Not my people. Um, they do not charge service fees for their, this, this small, Broadway, this company that I'm talking about that's actually a Broadway company, they don't charge fees for their outreach and special access programs. They don't charge fees for their smallest theater. They also have a lower fee for their off-Broadway space. Communicating the various fees in their advertising would be extremely expensive and confusing since the fees vary depending on the space and the audience. In all cases, the service fees only apply when a patron purchases a ticket online or by phone. By purchasing a ticket in person, a, patron's, a patron can afford to avoid these fees. At online ticketing sites, the service charge and fees are clearly marked when you go to your cart. At that point, you can choose to cancel the purchase. And almost every company, even those with in-house box offices or those who have no theater companies and use an online box office like Theater Mania, Ticket Central, or Brown Paper Tickets, my question for you is, if the theater company does what you want them to do but the online ticketing doesn't disclose the fee, who's charged? And how do you make sure that the online people don't charge the theater company for what they're doing wrong? And don't forget that these fees exist because credit cards are charging each company a fee every time a credit card is processed. Theaters don't do this to be sneaky. They do it because they can't afford to cover their operating costs. And if I can have two more minutes, I'll just list very briefly. Um, things are tough right now for my theaters. Um, I'm gonna s just go to the end. We made 15, we make loans to our members of up to $50,000 for cash flow because it costs a lot of money to produce a play before you get any revenue in from tickets. Last year we made 15 loans. In four months of the fiscal year we're in currently, we've made 13 and I have two that are waiting to go to the loan committee. We have lost a lot of our revenue because of the midterm elections and people giving to that and not making contributions or even coming to the theater. It is tough times right now. So I would say to you, my members are happy to have one line that says fees may be included with this purchase. 
and I'm happy to work with your office to find out how to make the consumer's ticket buying experience more helpful, but please understand that there's a dollar sign that goes with every line, with every disclosure. Thank you so much. Uh, th thanks for testifying. Uh, have you had, have both of you had a chance to speak to uh, the bill sponsor, Justin Brennan? No, but yeah. he's my new council member, so I'd love to meet okay, him. Okay, you should, you should reach out to his office. I will definitely do that. And I live um, in his district. Yeah, okay, great. Um, okay, thank Perfect. you. We'll take your testimony into consideration, but I also suggest Do you, you want to keep this? Uh, sure. You can give it to Caitlin in the back there. Um, all right, thank you. I mean, with, 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 all, with all of that said, um, we are going to take all of the testimony into consideration uh, to see how we can best amend these bills moving forward. Um, and this meeting is adjourned.